All right, we should be live. Uh, welcome, everyone. We'll just wait uh, a couple of minutes for uh, for people to join us on YouTube. But please introduce yourself in the uh, YouTube chat. Tell us where you're from, what you're teaching, what uh, ages or grade levels. And uh, yeah, um, hopefully we'll have a wonderful session with Katrina today. I'm really excited to see all these people joining that I know on Twitter. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. I feel like waving to everybody. I know that you can't. Uh, I know I look like an idiot doing that. <laughs> so I'm making an idiot of myself to say hello to you. <laughs> People can wave back in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> From... France, Scotland, uh, Salvador, uh, in the US, all over the world. It's a slightly different time than our usual webinars. We've adjusted it uh, for, uh, for European time zones, which also means that I can attend. Uh, usually those webinars are at midnight or 1 a.m. for me. Um, and I just watch the recording afterwards. And uh, yeah, really nice to be here live this time. I'm very grateful that you uh, that you moved it for me because I would not be a good speaker at midnight. That is uh, uh, very understandable. Yes, um, no, of course. Oh, All right, well, there are people from the US. This is impressive. Yeah, um, I know that some of my team is still teaching at the moment, but depending on where. Maybe it's lunch break or something at the moment. Uh, we are uh, really excited that you could join us. Uh, well, I'll start with um, introductions and um, uh, a short overview. And uh, yeah, while more people are joining before uh, Katrina starts the, um, her presentation. Um, Katrina teaches maths to 11 to 18 year olds in North Essex in England. Um, and uh, she also works with other teachers through her local maths hub. Um, in her spare time, Katrina enjoys creating and coloring in geometry puzzles, and I assume most of you will have uh, already seen them on her Twitter page, and if not, you uh, definitely need to follow her. Um, this is uh, the Twitter page, and if we just scroll down a little bit, you can see a few of the uh, beautiful and colorful and really clever constructions that she posted recently. I'm not sure if you keep a track of how many there are, but I feel like it must have been uh, thousands by now. Um, and it's uh, definitely several hundreds. Several yeah. hundreds at least. Uh, yeah, so um, follow Katrina, um, make sure you, you try out some of the puzzles and I'm sure we'll see uh, many more during the presentation today as well. Um, we, we run these sort of webinars and, and workshops every couple of weeks. And if you go to the Mathigon website, mathigon.org slash pd, you can see all of the upcoming events we have, as well as recordings of past events. If you can't make them because of timings or, or if you missed one and want to watch them. So you can see here in two weeks, for example, we have a webinar about data science tools coming up, uh, which should be really interesting I've got some recordings of, of past events that you can watch. And if we scroll a little bit further, this is our guest speaker series. So the recording from Katrina should be posted um, in a couple of days. And in April, we have Desiree. And in May, we have Jennifer joining us. Um, so uh, those should be really excited. And uh, you can join all of these events um, just by clicking these links on Eventbrite. And all of these events, like all of Mathigon, is completely free to use. Um, in, in case you haven't played around with Mathigon a lot, right at the top of this PD page, we've got some introductory pages for different age groups, which does tell you a little bit about how you can use the tools on Mathigon um, with uh, your students or on your own. And just before you start, I wanted to show you um, uh, one of our tools, which is called Polypad, which is um, sort of the most popular part of our website. And this is an open canvas or virtual whiteboard with hundreds of different tools and features for exploring mathematics and almost like a little mathematical playground. So we can drag out some of these shapes, for example, and, uh, and try to create a tessellation 
or we can try to create the net of uh, three-dimensional solids. So um, you can see all of the shapes should snap together very seamlessly. And here I've got a prism. And if I select all of those shapes and then click the fold net button here, it turns it into a three-dimensional solid. I can then rotate and play around with or, or unfold. So uh, really powerful for students uh, to explore geometry. And there are many other uh, tools to, to play around with. I really like these uh, prime factor circles, which you might have seen in the prime climb board game that Dan Finkel invented. So uh, every color represents a different um, prime factor of numbers. 12, for example, is 2 times 2 times 3. 2 is yellow, 3 is green. And then I can take these numbers and take them apart. For example, if we take a 2 out of the 12, we're only left with 6. If we drop the 2 onto um 15, we get 30, and there are some really cool number theory ways to, um, to explore these um, factors of numbers. Uh, we have fraction bars, algebra tiles, balance scales, lots of probability tools, so we can have a couple of dice and just select them, click the roll button, and, and generate random numbers, spinners. I mentioned some of the data science tools, and we've got a webinar about those um, in, in more detail in, in two weeks coming up. And one thing that we just added last week were some additional logic tools. So in January, I think, we added these logic gates to the canvas. You can have buttons and switches and logic gates and light bulbs and connect them to create electronic circuits and help students learn about uh, computing. And then you can toggle these switches on and, and see what happens. And one thing that we just added um, a few days ago are um, music tools. So we can have a metronome, for example, and connect that to a speaker. We can select a few different sound effects that we want for the speaker. And then if we click play on the metronome, I hope you can hear that. Um, uh, it, it sends out these pulses through the electronic circuits. And you can create all sorts of interesting rhythms and, um, uh, and uh, sound with that using logic gates. If you want to learn more about any of these tools on Polypad, just click the question mark button in the corner, and then we've got lesson plans, tutorials, um, in-depth explanations for all of the different tools. And um, yeah, uh, please get in touch if, if there's anything else you want to know. But uh, so much for my introduction. Um, let's start with the actual presentation. So yeah, over to you, Katrina. I, you. I will in the... Um, oh, the I'll just talk for a minute before I start drawing um, because I wanted to say hello and I'm so excited that this many people have come to listen to me and I hope you have a good time. I'm just, I love talking about maths and this is really cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few geometry puzzles uh, because although kind of most of my time is spent teaching maths uh, to 11 to 18 year olds, um, yeah, I, I feel like most people are probably here and I'm pretty sure the reason I got invited to give this talk is because I spend way too much time making uh, nicely coloured in <laughs> geometry puzzles. Um, so I thought I'd just talk really quickly about like why, why geometry puzzles, because that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and the main reason is I, I really like geometry. Um, but actually, I think there's a few reasons for that. And one is I really I do like colouring in. Um, but I really enjoy kind of the visual nature of that. Um, and I'm a big fan of Mathigon as well. And I know that that's sort of one of your values is like maths is visual. Um, and I'm a, a kind of big believer in that. I really like um, kind of explaining things with diagrams and, and thinking about things with diagrams. I think that comes quite naturally to me. So apologies if you're one of these people who I've discovered there are people who can't visualize things and like hold mental images. I, I just can't imagine that world. Like my, my head is full of images all the time. Um, so apologies if that's you. And I hope you still get something good out of this. I'll try and draw some pictures so that you have something to look at. Um, but yeah, um, apart from kind of just the, the visual, like the engaging aspect of it, I think one of the reasons that geometry puzzles do really well on Twitter is that it's one of those kind of areas of the curriculum that doesn't necessarily look like a maths question or you can make it look not just like something out of textbook um and there's like a whole little community of of maths puzzle people on twitter but it's mainly geometry pro problems um and i love it like i just love how many people kind of contribute their solutions and their own puzzles uh but i think geometry works really nicely for this 
because if you're making up algebra problems they they sort of have a tendency to even if they do hide some beautiful structure just kind of look a, a lot like an exercise and you can make map, uh, geometry puzzles look really engaging um and it's also something that you know like people from universities uh comment on this people at school can do these i'm going to try and show you some that i use with the younger students that i teach uh so we call them year sevens if you're not in there uh, in england then year sevens are kind of 11 to 12 year olds and they're they're the youngest students in my school um yeah i think there's because we don't necessarily fully exploit all the the kind of geometry that there is at school it means that it, there's still stuff left to explore once you've left and uh, there's still loads of really fun things that i've only discovered in the last couple of years and so most of what i put on twitter is is just kind of uh yeah me trying to get other people to discover something nice that i think i found so i'm going to show you a few nice things um yeah basically talk about a couple of puzzles but more from a, a sort of teacher's perspective um I should say, by the way, when I'm talking about my students, so at our school, we uh, a couple of years ago kind of tried to list out our our vision for what um, teaching math should look like at our school. So we've got these kind of four mathematical values that we try and um, try and get across in our lessons. Uh, so the first one is everyone can get better at maths. Uh, we've got uh, we all learn from our mistakes. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, my favourite one, thoughtful ideas are more important than quick answers. And uh, I've gone and forgotten the fourth one. Oh, good mathematicians ask lots of questions. Right. Which is um, a good place to start, I think. So, Philip, do you mind sharing my visualiser so I can draw some pictures? Here we go. Um, I'm going to draw you a picture. And my first kind of question to you is what questions does this picture make you want to ask? So here we go. Yeah, it's close enough. That was supposed to be a rectangle. Imagine there are right angles there. Yeah, they're right angles. Okay, here we go. I'm going to mark on uh, this point here and a point there and a point there. What questions is this diagram making you want to ask? And I know there might be a bit of a delay in uh, getting comments popping up on, on this system once you type them in. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Philip, first of all, if you're still there. Is this diagram making you want to ask any questions? Yes. Um, well, I will ask some questions, but please uh, put them in the chat as well. And even if there's a, I will try to uh, read them out later. And uh, one thing that some people have asked already is, are the points collinear? Can, can we draw a line that goes through all of them? Yeah, that's a great question. Are the points in a line? Um, there so are as it happens, today I've been teaching collinear points. We were doing vectors. Um, oh, brilliant. There's some comments popping up on the screen now that I can see. Are the points in a line? Definitely. What would the next one be? Yeah, I like that. Anything um, else interesting? Uh, um, the length of the diagonal, what is the ratio? between, I guess, the distance between the first two points and the next pair of points, mm, um, yeah. ratio of the areas of the squares, um, whether the lengths, so I guess this could be maybe the lengths of the diagonals, whether they're integers or not. Oh, yeah, diagonals. It's interesting you mentioned squares there, because I very specifically didn't say squares. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you've you've drawn them very close to squares, but uh, it's sort of interesting, I guess, also in in diagrams, what people assume by looking at it, even though there's, you know, uh, uh, no, uh, no explanation or, or no um, certainty that uh, certainly. I suspect yeah. people also know me quite well, and I'm quite, quite keen on squares. Um, <laughs> my, I, I guess my follow up question is, um, what if you could measure one thing what would you measure or maybe more than one thing how could you how could you tell if they are squares if i gave you one that was properly drawn to scale how would you tell if they were squares because i i was thinking about that the other day and i was i realized i've never really thought about it before like what what would you measure if you were trying to efficiently check whether something's a square you uh you mentioned before that they are supposed to be right angles so can mm -hmm. we 
that all of the angles are right or uh, yes. So, I mean, I guess one way would be if we know that they're all right angles to measure the width and the height or, or two sides of the square and see yeah. if, if they're equal. I'm not sure if the chat has other ideas for how we can determine if it's a square or not. I don't know what the answer is, but I was just thinking about it and trying to work out what the fewest pieces of information you need would be. Maybe um, if we draw the darkness and measure the angle between the darkness, we can do it in a single mm -hmm. measurement rather than uh, two different sides. That's true. So you're talking about a diagonal across here and a diagonal up there. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. Potentially. Um, yeah, it's... I don't know. It's quite tricky. I don't really have an answer to that one. It was just something that shook me that was interesting. I'm going to pick up on one of these questions to start off with. Let's pick up on this one, other points in the line, because that was the first thing that came up. Um, OK, well, the answer is no. But I think I don't need to tell you that if I tell you that they are squares. So if these are squares, those points are never in a line. Um, and so that's going to be our kind of starting point here. How would you convince somebody that those points are never in a line? Philip, do you have any thoughts? Well, I'm thinking we could do this really nicely in uh, GeoGebra or Polypad or something and maybe have a handle for one of the points and move it around and, uh, and see what happens. Um, it's a little bit harder to do on, um, uh, on paper maybe, but we could draw a line through the first two points and sort of continue that. And uh, what's what's the best way to see that? Maybe um, I guess you know, uh, you always have a little bit of extra um, ver vertical distance or, or height because um, the the line doesn't go through a vertex of the second square, it sort of goes, looks like about halfway up the first square um, to a corner. Yeah, that's a nice way of thinking about it, actually. Yeah, and somebody I can see has mentioned about diagonals being parallel, and actually that's quite a nice way to show that if these two lines are going to be going up at the same uh, angle, then, yeah, clearly if these two have to be parallel, we're, we're not going to hit it because we started too high up. Yeah, that's quite a nice one. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, so having proved that the points don't lie um, on a straight line, that means they do make... Sorry, I'm going to have to draw a new one because I've drawn way too much over that. I got too enthusiastic again. I'm going to draw this one differently again. It's like a whole different ratio. So just if you were getting comfortable with that diagram, this one's now changed. Uh, so if these points aren't in a line then they the thing is it they're starting to get closer to a line aren't they yeah and maybe you can start imagining what happens as they get bigger but it turns out they're not quite in a line so that means they're making a little triangle so this talk is supposed to be about generalizing so really, I want to think about like what happens to things as other things change. So we already said that as I can move from this diagram to one where the little square looks littler, they look more in a line now. Um, what happens if I made the little square even littler still, or actually maybe equivalently made the big square even bigger? That's a nicer way to think about this. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm wondering if people can picture kind of in in their heads like what's happening to this triangle like how is it still a triangle will it ever be a straight line still waiting for some uh, chat messages but i would think it it's always a triangle but it gets flatter and flatter and the the angle at the top gets closer and closer to 180 degrees um mm. until at some point we probably can't even distinguish it anymore on uh, on paper because it's uh, so uh, so thin. Yeah, so we've got this tiny little sliver of a triangle. Um, okay, so this is an activity that we we actually do um, at my school in year seven. Um, we do this in the area of a triangle block because our activity is this. What is the area of this triangle? 
Um, let's uh, put some links on it first of all. So I'm going to make this one. Oh, I don't know what should we have. Let's make this one ten and this one three. As you know, yeah, three twice now. This one ten and this one three and the squares. Remember, so this is all fine. Um, yeah. Right, how might we find that area? How do you think a year seven would approach it? What, what's an 11 year old gonna do? You're trying to find the area of something like this because it's a bit of a weird looking triangle. Uh, I'm, I won't lie, they find it hard. What would be your first step, Philip? What would you do? Um, well, I, I can see a few different triangles um, in this diagram. So I can see one triangle, for example, that's just half of the smaller square. Um, uh, so if you think about this one up here. Um, so I was thinking about the, the bottom half, but I guess Ooh, they are, okay. uh, uh, that's, uh, yeah, uh, should be the same area. So, um, and, and that's a very nice triangle because it's right angled, I guess. So uh, we, uh, I guess even uh, year seven students should be able to work out that this is a half times three times three. Yeah, and I can see I'm another sure triangle, which is yeah. sort of above the um, the slope in the larger square, um, which is not. Uh, so we first need to work out the height of the triangle, which would be ten minus three. Uh, um, yeah, that's seven, and the base is ten. So again, we can uh, calculate the um, the height of that triangle. Mm hmm. And one more triangle is underneath um, the big horizontal line from the bottom left corner to the top right corner. Um, that takes up uh, most of, uh, or is, is the largest. And again, uh, we can calculate the base and the height and then work out its area. And hopefully if we find the area of the two squares and then take away all of those triangles, we should be left with, um, the darker pink triangle that you showed before, that's um, the really thin one. Right, yeah. So this is what we get our students to do because they get loads of practice at, with brass angle triangles. Uh, they also get some very nice practice at um, kind of finding compound areas with subtraction, which I think is something that doesn't necessarily come naturally to students. They're, they're much more happy generally with putting things together to, to make something. Um, but yeah, going the other way can be quite tricky. Um, yeah, now um, I can see in the chat people have been doing the calculations for us, which I'm really grateful for because the chance of me actually doing any mental arithmetic, like even getting that 13 right, I was a little bit nervous. Um, well, live on YouTube is quite low. Um, yeah, so what we have to do, set out all of this, lots of lovely practice. Um, calculate the area is, is there anyone who is brave enough to give me an answer so that I don't have to do this horrible big thing so 10 squared plus 3 squared minus let's just say minus yellow minus blue minus pink oh I was really hoping in that time that would be enough time for a comment <laughs> to pop up but I think this is the delay on, on all of this um, I'm gonna have to work some stuff out, aren't I? At least I chose 10, 10 is kind of nice. Uh, oh, I can see four and a half and seven and a half coming up. Uh, let's go for that. Four and a half seems to be the most popular answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Four and a half, yes. Uh, okay, uh, four and a half units squared. I think I only need units on this because I'm being lazy. Um, okay, so what we then get our students to do is draw out a, um, a big table. And so if we, Call this kind of the little square and the bigger square they draw a big table where they say okay well I'm going to choose a value for a and a value for b and then I'm going to calculate the yellow and the blue and uh, the pink triangles just like we did there and then they're going to find the uh, area of the thin triangle which is the one that we're interested in and they get to all of these and they I'll subtract it. I guess I should maybe have a column for kind of the area of the two squares combined. Um, but we, we kind of do all of this. I'm just drawing what yellow, I mean by yellow and blue and pink so that I can talk about this and it makes sense. And we talk about how we might expect each value to change. So uh, pink was this one down here. 
and we had yellow and blue. I apologise for the kind of weird squeaky noises that my felt tips are making. I don't know if that's coming up on the camera at all. Uh, my pet, so yellow and pink and blue, there we go. Um, so then we get them to, to fill in all of this and find the remaining triangle. We did it with uh, three and ten and uh, some of you have uh, done the, the middle part, so I'll just put 4.5 in there for the moment. Um, okay, so then the next question is, well, like how might things change? So just as an exercise in this, if I kept that the same, but I made this one slightly bigger, uh, what's slightly bigger than 10? 10.76. I don't care about what the actual numbers are. I've tried to pick a number that will discourage you from doing any more mental arithmetic. I'm certainly not going to do any more mental arithmetic. What happens to the yellow area? Is it going to get bigger or smaller when A stays the same and B gets slightly bigger? So I'm just changing one thing. And what happens to the blue area in the pink? Sorry, Philip, go for it. Um, I think if A stays the same, the yellow sh area should uh, also stay the same, right? Because um, if, uh, if if we go back to the previous slide or something that uh, didn't really, we didn't need 10 to calculate uh, the area of the yellow triangle, which was B, it was just based on three. So uh, yeah, that shouldn't change, hopefully. Yeah, excellent. So yeah, yellow is definitely going to stay the same. We didn't change A. The yellow is oh, like within that square. It doesn't change. Um, the other two are slightly harder to, to reason about. Um, blue area, is that going to get bigger or smaller? Remember, the little square stayed the same size, but I'm stretching out that big one slightly. Um, so blue area is harder to think about. Pink area and thin area, also harder to think about. Um, what about I don't know which one seems most obvious to you to look at to look at next? So I, I would say pink um, makes sense that um, uh, it it gets bigger. So we know um, the base of the triangle gets a little bit bigger, the height of the triangle gets a little mm -hmm. bit bigger. So um, the area should also get um, a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's that makes sense to me. If you make something longer and also taller. It seems fairly reasonable. Its area should get bigger. Uh, blue one, blue one. I'm just seeing something pop up to say that that one's also going to get bigger. Yeah, um, I, I guess it's the same reasoning. The base gets a bit longer. The height might be a bit trickier to visualize because you're subtracting the yellow area. But because that doesn't change, um, the height yeah. should also get bigger in this case. Yes. So yeah, it's sort of because I've kept this the same, that's quite nice. And it, this sort of teaches uh, students a, a nice lesson about uh, if you're going to go, go around investigating something, definitely try and change one thing at a time, um, which I know they do in science, but I think modelling those kind of mathematical skills is, is kind of important. Um, now, what we'd actually have the students do usually is give them feed them now some nice values and ask them to, to go off and work a few things out. Might give them a bit of choice in uh, what they decide to do. Are they going to keep A the same all the way through and just change their B values? Are they going to try and keep B the same and change their A values? Are they going to try and, I don't know, we want to kind of emphasise that they keep something the same, uh, but another possibility might be to keep the relationship the same, like the ratio of size, just double everything and see what happens there. Um, Big spoiler, because <laughs> we're not going to do it. Turns out that um, if you keep A the same, then the thin triangle also always stays the same, which is pretty I handy. think some people in chat uh, managed to do this calculation and, and found the answer and were uh, very impressed by that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's not obvious, is it? Especially because, like, we already talked about how much that triangle changes. Like, it, it changes its dimensions quite a lot. It's also a weird triangle that's not easy to think about. Um, so you've kind of got a few options here. Like, you've spotted something that's the same. You've made this generalisation that we think that if we keep this the same, well, we might have spotted a pattern. But if we want to make a generalisation, we need to have some way of justifying it. So 
I think what teachers would tend to do now, like if you give this to a group of teachers, they're like, great, I can I can jump into the algebra. Um, you know, I'm going to call this A and I'm going to call this B and I'm going to work out each of these in terms of A and B. Um, and it it will magically all simplify down so that you end up getting the same answer every time. Uh, you'll find that it only depends on A. Uh, year sevens don't tend to do that because they, they met kind of algebraic expressions formally well a little bit in primary school maybe um we we do it a bit in year seven before they get to this point but it's um you know they're, they're not familiar with it it's not their go-to uh there is a way that that we can generalize this within kind of year seven geometry though um and this is where to really blow their minds which is that so far all the triangles that we we found the area of were all right angles but of course we we can do non right angle triangles. The key to it, though, is that if we've got the base, then we need to measure the distance between the base and a line parallel to it and find that perpendicular height. And once we've got this, the perpendicular height, then we're fine. We can relate this to the diagram. And this is the really lovely bit. I know there are loads of people who've seen this before, and it's, it's probably not special if you've seen it before. But, oh, I've genuinely heard class full of year sevens not my class I was just in the corridor and I heard uh heard a class full of year sevens when they did this and they were actually like oh it was just magic it was so cool um right here we go let's do a nice little brief because yeah we could do some algebra but this is nicer in my opinion mainly because I'm lazy Right, here we go. So where was my triangle? It was like this, wasn't it? Yes, because I picked these three points. Okay. Now I need a base and a height. So I've got three sides. It's not obvious what the base is, but I could kind of keep turning it around, couldn't I? So I could have like, this is the base. I could have it around here, so this is the base. Or well, I'm actually going to stick with this one where this is the base along the bottom. So this is my new base. Let me get a different colour just to highlight the base. There we go. Right, so I said that if I wanted the base, I needed to find the distance between this base and a line parallel to it. Well, we sort of talked about at the beginning, didn't we, how the diagonals of squares are parallel. And this base is the diagonal of a square. So a line parallel to it that goes through this vertex is the diagonal of the other square. So the perpendicular height is just the distance between these two diagonals. Now, I mean, that doesn't massively help yet. It might do for somebody who knows a bit of, say, Pythagoras' theorem and can uh, find the height of a, a square when they know two of the sides. Um, doesn't massively help a year seven because they haven't seen that before so they at least they've got a sense of what they would measure though um let's have a, another go at quick diagram i'm going to spin this around because i find it really hard to draw a square when it's not there we go i need a second one of these here we go here's my extra copy of that now i can turn it back around again i just can't draw the squares when they're not uh, <laughs> nicely aligned right uh, so we said this was the base. Now the thing is, the thing about this is that of course any triangle that has this base and this height we know has the same area. So you know, for example, the right angle triangle here uh, has the same area because it's got the same base and the same height. So I'm going to draw you another triangle that also has this as the base. And we said that we needed this to be the height, this difference between the the base and its parallel line and of course another triangle that I could have is this one there we go that's got the same base it's got the same height it's got the same base and it's got the same height then it must have the same area and the thing about this area up here is it's a lot nicer to to calculate the area of this because of course it's just half a square. I think I said my square was three the first time. Well, the area of this, if that's three, 
is just going to be half times three times three, 4.5. That's good. We can check it against what we got before. That means this one, also 4.5. Thanks, Karen. I, I like it too. <laughs> um, of course, that, that only depended on three. This is anything we like. Uh, that doesn't say equals zero. That's my surprise face. Um, it's sheer joy. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. It is sheer joy. Um, the say yeah, this process is called shearing. You, I really like kind of imagining it move turn it back around because it's much easier to visualize or certainly to year seven it's much easier to visualize if you can see the base and then you can imagine this parallel as this point moves along here the area stays the same i think it is worth once they've got the idea also picturing it in a different orientation uh, so that they don't become like me and unable to picture things unless they're aligned nicely but yeah we can shear this all the way back along here it drives right down to this point maintaining its area that goes, oh, it's lovely. Um, okay. Yeah, that's one of my favourite favorite puzzles. Uh, okay, let's do a different puzzle. Um, I think we'll do some angles. It's going to have squares again, though, because I like squares. So this next puzzle, I should say neither of these puzzles that I'm going to show you are, are ones that I've made. They're ones that I've stolen from other people because I really like them. Um, I wasn't even the person who put that activity into our math department scheme of work, which is how I know I work in such a cool place uh, that somebody else decided that was a good activity for year seven to do. Um, OK, right. What am I going to do? Angles. Yes. So I have used this this puzzle today or this activity with students, um, although it was six formers. So these are 18 year olds who are in a sort of enrichment session. So they're not just 18 year olds, they're the super keen 18 year olds. Um, turns out they haven't done much geometry for a while. So they found it fairly tricky. Right, this is an isosceles triangle. This is a square. Um, it's not a prism. It took them a while to get over the idea that, that this was a, a kind of badly drawn prism. It's not meant to be 3D. Um, I'm gonna join up this bottom corner to this top corner, just two points this time. So they are definitely in a line. And that gives me lots of lovely angles that I'm gonna ask you about. So I'm gonna start down here and call this one A, B, this is C, D. Uh, that one up there isn't so interesting. I know that's a right angle. E, F, what else could I have? I guess I could go around the middle here, can I? G, H, I, and J, that's probably everything that I've got. Uh, right. It definitely, they really thought it looked like a, a wonky prism once I'd drawn the diagonal line in. So if you're picturing wonky prisms, you, you need to step back from that. It's um, it's definitely two dimensional. Um, right, yeah, yeah. First question, if I tell you, Ooh, what do you like? If I tell you that A is 70 degrees, what can you do with that information? If I tell you A is 70 degrees, what can you do? Where do you go next? I'll tell you what, um, while people are having a chance to put something in the chat, Philip, I'm going to come back to you. Where would you go next with the information that A is equal to 70 degrees? So I would ignore the square um, to start with and just look at the isosceles triangle maybe. And if we know that A is 70, we know that B plus C on the other side must also be 70. Uh, we yeah. know that the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. So we should be able to calculate the size of D at the very top, which is mm -hmm. uh, which should end up being 40 degrees, I think, if we have 180 minus 70 times two. I've seen Sam has also put D is 40 degrees in the chat and Ted's put that in the chat. Excellent. So you're, uh, yep, you're correct. Okay, so we've got D is 40 degrees. Um, nice. Can we go anywhere else? Well, there's another isosceles triangle, I think, which is a bit harder to see maybe because the sides are different colors. But if we look at 
the left side of um, the first isosceles and the top edge of the square and the orange diagonal. Because we know that the two sides are, um, uh, are the same, this should also be an isosceles triangle. So we know that E equals C at least. So uh, Excellent. And actually, that's something you could have told me without me telling you A is 70. So I'm going to have it kind of floating on its own at the moment. Um, good. And I've seen, um, I'm sure I saw that, that pop up behind kind of somebody working out what that is. There's a, a really complicated expression for this uh, to get that in terms of D. But I think it's just saying add D to 90 degrees to get this top angle here. Take that from 180 and then halve it. So kind of combined with this D is 40. I went too far that way. I'm going to run out of space, so it's going to have to come over here. Um, e equals C equals, uh, what was it, 25 degrees, I think somebody put. Is it 25 degrees? I really hope so. I, I can't find it now on the screen, and now I'm really worried I've done some math. Uh, yes, 25 degrees. degrees. At least in the chat, yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's really high pressure doing, uh, doing maths while people are watching you, isn't it? Okay, so we've got 25 degrees. Where would you go from there? I saw somebody talk about F. Uh, we can yeah. make uh, e plus F, F because we've got this. It's uh, a right angle, so that's 90 degrees. And if we know E is 25, mm -hmm. then um, F must be 75 degrees. Uh, 65, yes. Sorry, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, don't worry. I'm, I'm, it's making me feel a lot better that I'm not the only person who gets nervous about trying to do mental arithmetic. <laughs> um, good. So we've got all the way to F. We could get uh, G H I from here now. Um, we could, actually, this is interesting because this is where I feel like my method was not very good. Um, I what did I do to get that? I feel like I did a lot of messing around with triangles and quadrilaterals and and things to get. G, H, I, and J, and then I felt silly about it later. So I've seen somebody pop up with their G is uh, 115 degrees. Ooh. I guess F and H are alternating angles um, because the two sides of the square are parallel. And then working out the yeah. other at the center should be quite uh, quite easy. That's That's the bit that I just didn't spot. Of course, we've got two parallel sides. It's in a square. Like obviously, F and H and J should all be the same because we've got the parallel lines there. But I did not get that for a while. Yep. So uh, I is equal to G and J is equal to H. Okay. So we've got everything from here. Um, okay. So next question. That was all starting from the the sort of assumption that I told you A was equal to seventy. But what if what if A got very slightly bigger, like 71.04 degrees? Again, number chosen so that to try and dissuade you from uh, plugging this straight into your calculator. What if A got very slightly different? Which, which of these is going to get bigger and which is going to get smaller? Oh yeah, I, I really like this kind of idea of showing a chain of reasoning, which I've just seen in, as a comment. Yeah, because um, that's that's sort of what we want, isn't it? Chains of reasoning, but you want to know what depends on what else and, and kind of where it comes from. Um, and hopefully it's gonna give us a, a bit of a sense here. So if I tell you that this one's gone up, what happens to the others? So, this is not an easy question. This is the sixth form has struggled a bit with this. Um, one of them did try to actually. Yeah. Work it out. Sorry, I interrupted you there. <laughs> um, just reading out some chat messages. So D gets smaller if um, if A gets bigger. Okay, so D is going to get smaller. Uh, yeah, can you explain why, Philip? Um, well, if we again look just as um, at the initial. Um, isosceles triangle, if uh, 
I, I would imagine a getting a little bit bigger is just the um, triangle sort of shrinking a little bit or, or the, the sides moving in um, towards each other. Um, so, and that means the angles at the bottom get bigger and the one at the top needs to get smaller. Yeah, I, lo I loved your hand gestures there because that's exactly how I would think about it as well. Yeah, it sort of gets pointier, doesn't it? Um, we've got a little bit pointier. That means the top angle is going get, to get smaller. Um, right, okay. Uh, so I guess we also know, well, I'm in this little loop that um, B plus C was equal to A, so it's going to have gone up. We don't necessarily know about B and C separately, though. It might be that one's got bigger. It might be that uh, they've both got bigger. We, we don't know kind of where that effect's coming in. Right, let's follow this around then. So D's got smaller. So what's that going to have done to E and C? Has anybody answered that yet? I haven't been keeping up. Ah, C and E. Ah, oh, hi, Sam. Sam's one of my colleagues, uh, who is unfortunately, I'm going to completely out you to everybody on the internet. Has had tonsillitis, so I haven't got to see her today. So it's very nice to hear from you, Sam. Um, so, yes, yeah, so these ones are going to get bigger. And it's kind of the opposite. Um, it's the opposite thing, isn't it? Like it's getting, well, actually, you know, I guess, yeah, it's getting kind of, I can't yes, tell you to describe it. I've run out of words for that. Um, but yes, if D gets smaller, then they have to get bigger to take up the slack kind of, don't they? Right, what about F? We got F? Well, since we know E plus F is 90 degrees, if E gets bigger, F, uh, F needs to get smaller. Uh, ah, yes. Yeah, good point. So looking over here. Yeah, and that's nice. And we've got the sense of something fixed and the, the kind of line moving, kind of swinging around within it, don't we? Um, OK, so F's going to get smaller. Uh, now, we said, didn't we, that these two are always equal to F because of the parallel line. So... Uh, they're going to get smaller as well. I guess just to finish it off, that means these ones are going to get bigger. Uh, have we? Is that every angle have we accounted for now? I think we've got everything in our chain. Oh, we didn't talk about B and C separately. Do we know anything about B and C separately from over here? So there's an upwards orange arrow on top of E equals C equals 25 at the top. Yeah. So that might help us. Okay. So we know, actually, that's true. So we know that C has got bigger. Uh, do we know about, and we know that this one's got bigger. Do we know anything about B? You see, B is a big mystery here. I find it really hard to reason about B. Uh, so students. Because, like, we know that the total of B and C has to get bigger, and we can prove that C gets bigger. But the question is, like, what does that leave for B? Like, you can imagine all the scenarios, can't you? Like, it might be that this one's getting bigger, the total's getting bigger faster than C is, and that means B has to get bigger as well. Or it might be that uh, the total's getting bigger smaller than C is, so that means actually B is getting smaller, but it's being cancelled out by a, a really big increase in C. So the total's sort of increasing a little bit. Or it might be that they're getting bigger at exactly the same rate and like B is just sort of sitting there and, and not doing anything, but kind of the total gets pushed up just by C. Um, yeah, like anything's possible. So let's just thinking about the diagram again, sort of picturing it. Can you picture what happens? So just focusing on B now, if I make A bigger, can you picture how the, how the diagram moves? Like what's going to happen to B? Because I think it's going to be easy to get bogged down a bit in all these letters floating around. I did promise very little algebra and I'm, I'm aware that I've now got letters everywhere, but uh, letters aren't the same as algebra. Right. It's still quite hard to reason about. Um, likely to get smaller, stays the same. Um, yeah, you see, like, this is... Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking, for example, is if we imagine we just close the um, isosceles triangle entirely so that the bottom Ooh. left and right corners are the same, 
then we know B must be 45 degrees because it goes straight through the square um, and it's a diagonal. And the other extreme would be that the isosceles triangle is almost entirely flat. Um, so D would be 180 degrees in that case. And in that case, B is still 45 degrees because it goes across um, sort of another diagonal line um, towards the top square. So it's 45 degrees on both extremes. So uh, the question is, I guess, what happens in between? So you closed it up or you sort of opened it out, didn't you? Um, you know, like flattened the whole diagram. So it kind of went to, to this sort of thing. I've realized I can't actually draw my square in, but uh, then went a bit further. So it was completely flat, just with a <laughs> poor little square sitting on the edge. Is that right? Uh, no, that's, that's, I haven't drawn what you're picturing, have I? Uh, I think that looks right, yeah. Okay. And then what have we got? Ah, and then it's like this, yeah. There to there. Yeah, that is it's sort of degenerate thinking, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like that's the, that's the sort of way a mathematician thinks, or that like annoying child uh, who is always trying to catch you out. But actually, it's such a great way to think here, isn't it? Um, yeah, so they, those are both 45 degrees. And of course, we already saw a third special case that was 45 degrees, which was, uh, oh, did we ever actually work it out here? No, we didn't. Oh, we should have gone back and worked it out. So in this case, well, once we know that is 45 we can combine that with this sorry c is 25 degrees so b must be 45 degrees to keep 70 in this special case so we've now got three special cases 70 degrees and what we call in this one 90 degrees and zero degrees um where it's always 45 so you know that's um i don't know cause for investigation really isn't it um now, as you might imagine, with students, we might make them create a table with all of these values in A, B, C, D, uh, all the way up, and give them different, slightly nicer starting values. So do it with 70, do it with 75, do it with 85. Um, keep working all the way through. There's lots of practice of this. But spoiler, B is always 45 degrees. So I guess, given that I've got five minutes or so, uh, we might as well talk about a few ways to try and justify that because I like it feels really nice, but we're not really making a generalization, are we? Until we can, until we can justify it. So, uh, oh, what'd be a good way to do this? I'll show you how my sit form has justified it, which I thought was nice. They started thinking about like what is the chain of reasoning that gets you from A to uh, what we're we trying to get to B from A to B, like how do we get there? Um, and they said to get from A to B, you can only work out B once you know C. And uh, to get C, you first need to work out D, but you can get D straight from A. So this is like their chain of reasoning across here. And then they looked at like how things change. So um, their reasoning was, this, that to get D, you have to double A and subtract from 180. Now, these are 18 year olds, so obviously they they went straight in with uh, OK, well, this is going to be 180 minus 2A. I think that's probably a step too far for an 11 year old, but definitely this chain of reasoning they could construct. Um, OK, and then the next step. Uh, how do you get from D to C? Well, you, um, what do we do? Ah, right, of course, we use the second, uh, I saw these triangles, so I should show you the picture again, just in case you've forgotten. So we added D to 90, subtracted that from 180, and then halved it. So add D to 90, subtract from 180, and halve. Sorry, I'm aware that my handwriting is not a presentation standard, but hopefully you know what I'm doing. Um, OK, so we might write that as uh, 180 minus D plus 90 all over 2. And then finally, we have to work out B and we get from C to B by uh, subtract C from A. Oh, 
uh, sorry, A minus C. Okay. And then their reasoning went like this. Here we have doubled A. I've got this factor of two in there. It's not showing up brilliantly. Sorry if that's made it really difficult to read. So D changes any effect on A has double the effect on D. So any change here is doubled. Uh, let's say small change, double that change. But next part, we then subtract uh, D from 90 degree, add D to 90, subtract from 180 and halve it. And the key part is halve it. I'm not gonna do that in orange because that will definitely be too dark. So halve it here. Um, so this kind of over two over here. So that means that any change for C will be half of the change at D. So from this, they argued that A and C change at exactly the same rate. And if A and C change at exactly the same rate, and we already have the uh, kind of equation, well, actually I've got it here, A minus C to get B. If these are changing at the same rate, then the difference between them is constant. I thought that was a really nice line of line of argument. I can't spell difference now. Difference. There we go. Same change, constant difference. Um, yeah, like what a lovely thought. I really like this idea of kind of having a chain of reasoning and thinking about the rate of change at each point. Of course, then they what they did is they said, oh, well, we can just you know, keep substituting things in. And actually, if you work this through, uh, if you are an algebra person, you almost certainly have already uh, scribbled down all of this and you find that it does work out. B, when you finally get down to sort of A minus C and all your uh, minus signs magically align and you get B equals 45 degrees independent of, uh, of whatever A is, it's so nice. Um, yeah, I really like this. So, yeah, that's one way to justify it. I think I'm probably going to stop talking about these puzzles because I'm where we're definitely coming up to uh, to an hour. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for participating so much. Like, that was brilliant. That was so much fun. And uh, thank you for, for sharing these really wonderful puzzles. It sounds like um, people in the chat uh, were sometimes blown away. Um, definitely, I, I could almost hear the, uh, the virtual O as, as people realized what was going on. We don't have that much time for questions, but um, feel Sorry. free to put anything in the chat um, if you want to ask Katrina. And maybe I can start. Um, how do you even come up with some of these puzzles that you post? And how do you, from completely random constructions, work out what these invariants are or um, interesting uh, connections between geometric shapes. I've, I've just seen, by the way, somebody saying draw a circle. Oh my goodness, yes. I'll, I'll probably put it on Twitter, but yeah, draw a circle. It's magic. Um, how do I do it? So this is my like little notebook. I brought this because I everyone always asks this and then they don't believe me when I tell them the answer. So I'm, I sort of brought it to show you. Like I draw loads and loads of pictures and almost all of them have nothing kind of to do with it. Uh, so there's just like scribbles like all the way around kind of other problems that I've I've drawn there are just all these these scribbles and then every so often I'll hit something nice and then you'll see kind of a nicely drawn out one but most of them are just doodles like you know that's me constructing a load of hexagons and I just kind of draw all over stuff and most of it really doesn't come out anywhere but occasionally you find something and and I do like do a load of random little algebra bits around the side as well because I'm not some magic person who can kind of do all of this in my head. Yeah, most of the time I'll just kind of be randomly angle chasing and really hoping that something comes out nicely. And when it does come out nicely, then I start thinking about how I can hide it in a way that will make other people discover the same thing that I have. Well, the notebook looks uh, spectacular. I uh... I assume at some point there will be an exhibition of all of your drawings and, and sketches somewhere. And uh, I can't wait to uh, take a look. 
um, if uh, I think we posted a link in the chat, but you have also published a book with uh, many of the, those geometric puzzles. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe, David, we can uh, share that again and people can um, buy that on Amazon if they want to see more of your work. This is true, although you're most, mostly giving your uh, money to Amazon if you do that. So, uh, you know, find Are there better internet. places to uh, uh, where you want us to buy that or? Oh, oh no, no, it's, uh, it's only them that ever makes any money out of it. <laughs> Uh, any other questions um, from the chat? Uh, I've just seen how do kids react to invariants. Ah, oh, like if you set if you set it up in the right way, they love it. But like anything, you know, if you sometimes they're like, yeah, whatever. But you have to really sell it. So I think making them do it the long way before they realise there is something not changing. And the other thing that makes a massive difference, and you mentioned it before, Philip, something like GeoGebra where you can actually move things and show them that it's not changing is incredible. Um, I don't know whether Polypad does moving things, but any software that allows you to move is just such a, like such a tool in a classroom. They love watching things move, especially when something doesn't change. All right. Well, um, thanks so much again for for your time and for sharing these uh, really beautiful mathematical puzzles. Uh, thanks to everyone who came and listened. Uh, we'll post the recording on YouTube in the next few days. If uh, you missed something and want to go back, or if you want to share this with um, any of your teacher colleagues who also um, should take a look at, at these uh, really great geometry puzzles. And, yeah, and if you try it with your kids, please let me know on Twitter how it goes, because I would really love to hear about how it goes. Uh, this is me on Twitter. Because I know it's not an easy one. Oh, I can't even spell my name. Try that again. This is me on Twitter. Please let me know how it goes. Thank you. Thank you for putting that in the chat because I can't spell it. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Uh, our next webinar is on data science in two weeks. Uh, hopefully we'll see Many of you there, it's a later time again, um, uh, targeted at the uh, US East Coast. But uh, yeah, all of those are recorded so you can watch them later. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye.